my name is Michael Farmer. I am a natural resource economist. I uh, uh, specialize in long-run land use change management. Uh, generally, what that means is uh, I look at how land uses over time, very slow changes and small changes in the rules can affect long-term outcomes. What land use economics finds it, 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 it is about is letting markets work, but it's also about setting rules, right? If there's no zoning, you end up with uh, porn shops next to grade, uh, grade schools. And of course, we don't want that. That's not good for either of those entities, right? So we, we, we have to have some rules to make it work. Uh, I like telling my class, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but it gets their attention, uh, how absolute monarchs created capitalism. The rules that were created for self-defense reasons in Henry's and Elizabeth were very, very heavy-handed. Yet, they happened to set up some of the contracts that turned out later to be quite useful to us. So, in setting those rules, let's think about it. You can't argue with market forces. That's true. Once the rules are in place, it's hard to argue with them. But are those rules efficient? Let's start with one. We need the free movement of inputs all across the world to, to move, to move uh, operations to their most efficient place. What are some of those inputs? Capital, natural resources, labor. If you immobilize one of those and you make the other ones mobile, you're going to create a distortion. We have pretty free movement of capital. We have borders. We have great restrictions in the mobility of labor. So when you look at the relative prices of that, how might you take advantage of this? If we're thinking about the ethics of uh, ethical obligations of living in a large uh, population community with scarce natural resources, we're going to have to find a way to make our labor very high value, very productive, very specialized. In some ways, if you have too many people for the resources, you probably also have too few people, you're, you probably have a labor shortage in terms of smart people to do it. So with 7 billion or 11 billion people, it's not that you have a bunch of extra people if you're doing it well. You probably can't, can't afford to lose the productivity of anyone, right? Uh, so what do we have in lo local capital markets? In the late 1970s, there was something of a promise uh, that was emerging of a grand new uh, high-tech, specialized, clean world, smarter and cleaner. Uh, looking at that almost 35 years later, one wonders whether we've, we've achieved that, whether in fact we're not dumber and dirtier, right? Okay, so uh, if capital markets move and labor can't, what will capital do? If it can't work in specialization because it can't pool labor appropriately, it's possible, and I think this is what's happened now, it may correct itself, but it's been happening for a while, it moves to very low-valued commodities it's all, that are all the same, that can be moved anywhere to any local population at its lowest cost. So we're not making necessarily smart things, we're making cheap things, and lots of them. Uh, that's an economic distortion. That's an economic distortion. That's an economic distortion. That is a market that is distorted. Those are prices that are regulated. Those are prices relationships that are fixed. Those are price relationships that send all the signals of what we do that are created and managed by governments. So we can't expect them necessarily to be the market force that we can't argue with. We've, we've, we've constructed it. What does that do to the ecology? Well, if you have this problem of impoverishation, you have, for example, right now, uh, a possibility of making things cheap. I just, I always bring this up, partly because I need to keep track of time, and I can't see the time, but also because it makes a point. We think these things are made very cheaply, right? They, they are. Most of the stuff, most of the weight of this thing is made very cheaply. The highest value added part of this, by the way, 20 to 40 percent of it, what country do you think it's made? Germany. Germany. The most sophisticated parts of this machine are made in Germany at wages at somewhere around $20 an hour. So that still exists if you want to be smart and you want to, if you want to be global. And I hope that works with some of the rest of the panel. Ecologically, though, making a lot of cheap stuff that depends on resources that can be replicated easily, not smart, uh, ends up in a situation where you find yourself constantly replicating uh, damage on resources 
rather than using them wisely. Because you're not using the people wisely, so you have to use the resources and bounty. That places strains on the environment. Uh, if we think about where, if we think about what we need to do with 11 billion people and the resources that we hope to climb, two things happen with that population. As it goes to 11 billion, we're all hoping all of the long-run sustainability projections that we have are based on the fact that that population goes down after that. If it goes down, it's an ecological necessity, we think. But how does that relate to smart labor forces? There is a, we, the fact that we know, I, I'm from a family of uh, five children. Both my parents were educated, both my parents were school teachers. None of my sisters, I'm a lone son and among four sisters, which basically means I had a I had trouble finding a bathroom in the morning. But, um, uh, aside from those, those traumas, none of my sisters has more than two children. Uh, that changes, right? If we want that change to come about, we do that with stable, stable life, life situations. So we have to stabilize the economic conditions. They have to be smart. They have to be clean. They have to be better. They have to be progressive. Right? We can't afford to have 11 billion people, of which 5 million, billion of them are poor. We, rich people, can't afford to have five billion poor people. We can't afford that. When we look at large projects, it's so easy to think you have easy solutions to this. There are lots of things out there that do a lot of good. Micro lending, ecotourism, but all of those are not, not solutions that are so easy, right? The best way to work with a developed country is to go visit it, stay a night in a hotel and come home. That, that helps, that helps. But a lot of the things that we need to do require that those locals be enabled themselves. We can't think of them as undifferentiated labor. We have to differentiate so we can specialize. That's what specialization means, right? To up our game, we have to do better. We have to specialize. Keeping people living at the margins means they can't specialize. They must generalize. If this crop goes bad over here, I need something over here to do this. Uh, Dr. Naj, working in Africa, knows the intricate sort of uh, uh, capital assurances that happen in local villages. So that's where we are. Um, we somehow have to act globally in some ways, just think globally, we have to act globally, but we also have to act locally and continue to do that in a very smart way. Um, one of the things I, I, I do overseas, and I'll, I'll kind of finish with this to, uh, to make the point, um, what I see overseas in rural areas, 40% of the population of the world is in farming in some way or another. That population is responsible for only 3% of the world's GNP, which means there's something like 10 to 12 times poorer than the rest of us, just by being in farming. When I go overseas, uh, I hear this all the time, we need this large palm plantation that, that clears the forest because farm, farming itself is an undervalued activity and you can't be wealthy being a farmer. Well, my name is Farmer. I happen to actually be from a farm. Uh, and I think I was doing okay, right? You get the rules right, farming isn't poor. And it's kind of a radical notion that unless you're a very large Latifundia, you can't make money farming. It's kind of a radical notion just to show up and say, I'm an American farmer and I'm wealthy. And I'm just a production farm to market kind of person just like you, and, they, and people can envision that. That kind of working at that kind of local level, the ethical obligations that we have both to continue to listen to people, make, take, the, take the great amount of experience people have to make all these assurances that they're doing, and turn that into a higher value added activity is a great challenge for us. Uh, we can do it, mostly we have to enable it, mostly we have to believe it, which is nothing more than just believing it. With that, I uh, hope I can uh, lead into our um, Dr. Dunham. Thank you.